ladies. Good evening. We have quite a full house tonight. How exciting. We have a great presentation today with two wonderful presenters who I know you will both find very engaging. So everybody who had a wonderful Thanksgiving, raise your hands. I think everybody had one. Are you all set for Christmas? Some people say yes, some people say no. I'm getting there. I haven't started my cookies yet. So I am Nan Taylor, and I get to be the MC tonight. I work for Aspirus Riverview Hospital, which I'm very proud to say and honored to be a part of. And uh, before we get started with our presenters and our great presentation, I would like to introduce Keith Lubke of the Grand Rapids Lions Club and Toys for Tots. So our Toys for Tots program are going to be the recipients of all those gifts that you brought tonight. Thank you very much. And I'd like Keith to say a few words. Thank you for the invitation. And on three, one, two, three, Merry Christmas. Let's try that again. One, two, three. Merry Christmas. Ah, much better. You make my heart swell with pride in the people in this community for what you do to help those kids that wouldn't have a Christmas if it were not for people like you. So tonight is a prime example of what happened in the lobby at the meet with the toys gifted to the Toys for Tots program. This program has been in existence since 1947 and it's served over a million and a half kids. And the Grand Rapids Lions, this is the fifth year we've taken this on as a service project. And with the help of the Southwood County Emerging Pantry Shelf, they do the sorting and bagging and keep the database. And the database of, of recipients comes from the social workers at schools, churches, and the community at large if Schweppes picks up the their names and they're on their database for food. So it is, it is a requirement, financial requirement, that the recipients have to fall into. And we, from the Marine Corps Reserve Foundation, have a guideline of from one year old to 14. But we don't let anybody fall through the cracks if they're 15, 16, 17, and go to the school system in Southwood County. And that, that's done through some gift cards, so nobody is left without Christmas on Christmas. And this year, the count as of today was 1,010 kids that we will serve, which is an amazing number. Last year was something like 946, but we are well over 1,000 kids this year. And with your help, we will be able to provide Christmas for that number of kids. And there are 60 businesses in our community where those toy drop boxes are. And I know that by the time we get done next week, the 12th and 13th of sorting the toys by age and then bagging them and tagging them with the number of the family, there are only a few people that know who those recipients are. That's not necessary, but we do it by number. Family's given a number and the bag has a number. So when they pull up to get their Christmas presents, that's how it's done. No names are put out to anybody. It's, it's a very good system and I'm thankful that SWEPS, the people at SWEPS, the food pantry, have done a marvelous job these fa fa last five years in, in making sure that happens. And this year we will do the sorting and bagging at Midwest Cold Storage through the graciousness of Greg and Kara McDonald. And we will also do the distribution there, which is saving us about uh, a day of time because we had to load semis and then haul them to Schweppes, move all the pantries out of the shelves out of the way, put the bags of toys in there, and then unload the semis and get them out of there before nine in the morning. So this year, through their graciousness, everything's going to happen right there. I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas, and I thank Aspirus and you aspiring women 
for the opportunity to give you a little information about what happens to those toys that you donated tonight. Thanks. So just a little fun fact about Keith. Why we didn't have aspiring men. <laughs> we said we tried, they wouldn't come. <laughs> then I explained some of Dr. Flinder's theories on men taking care of themselves versus women. He got it. So next, I would like to introduce Andrea Wagner, who is a registered dietitian at Aspirus Riverview. She chose our recipes for tonight which are in your folder, beautifully printed, and she's going to talk about why she chose these recipes. And she brought a little helper with her tonight, too. My daughter is here. I told her not to talk while I talk. We'll see what happens. <laughs> so, um, as Nan said, I'm Andrea, I'm a registered dietitian. Um, I'm happy to be here, as always. Um, the recipes that I picked for tonight I picked for a very specific reason, but we're going to get to that in a minute. First, I want to ask, when we talk about bone building, bone health, and nutrition, what are some of the first things you guys think about? Calcium. 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 Pretty much over the whole crowd. Calcium, vitamin D, maybe dairy products or milk, those are some of the common ones. And calcium and vitamin D are very important for bone strengthening and, um, and bone uh, building. And milk or dairy products are an excellent source of calcium and vitamin D. But these days, there's a lot of people that might be lactose intolerant, or they don't like drinking milk, or maybe they took dairy out of their diet for other reasons. So the recipes tonight are going to highlight ways to get all the nutrients needed for bone building, bone support, without having to rely on dairy products. Uh, so the first recipe is the spinach quiche, and it does have cheese in it. So you are getting calcium from the cheese in there, but the star of the show is the spinach. Spinach is high in calcium. It's also high in folic acid. And then the eggs used in the quiche, um, the yolk specifically is high in vitamin D and high, high in vitamin B6. So in the quiche you're getting the calcium and the vitamin D that you need for the bone building, bone strengthening, but then you're also getting some B vitamins which are needed for bone support also. And the chia seed put, pudding, the star of the show, is the chia seeds. They are high in calcium. Um, so not only are they high in calcium, but they're also high in magnesium and phosphorus. Um, magnesium and phosphorus are needed for additional bone support. And then in the roasted root vegetable skewers, um, there I think it had parsnips and potatoes in it, but the potatoes I wanted to talk about specifically, I think potatoes get a bad rap these days. A lot of people, I'm not eating potatoes anymore. Potatoes have so many amazing nutrients in it. Um, they're high in vitamin C, uh, B6. I have it right here, I'm trying so hard not to look at it, just remember. <laughs> Um, they're high in vitamin C, potassium, B6, and um, manganese. And all of those are needed for bone support. Um, so when you're eating all these foods together, you're getting um, calcium, vitamin D, magnesium, potassium, which are needed for bone building and bone strengthening. But you're also getting vitamin C, B vitamins, manganese, um, and a few other nutrients which are needed for um, some metabolic processes that are related to bone. So you're getting this wide variety of nutrients that are needed. And another reason why I picked these recipes is to kind of highlight that. Whenever we're talking about our health and nutrition, it's not about one nutrient. It's not about one food. It's about a variety of nutrients because they all work and support each other in different functions in our body. And we need that wide variety of foods from all the food groups. We need a wide variety of fruits and vegetables every single day. So we're getting all these nutrients and our bodies can have all that support it needs, whether we're talking about bone health or any other health reason that we might be trying to support our bodies with these nutrients. So as always, it's a pleasure to be here. I think I talked really fast, sorry about that. Hope you learned something and enjoy the show tonight. Thank you so much, Andrea. I'm always amazed with how much she can tell us about food. I, I think it's great. Next up, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Craig Flinders. Dr. Craig Flinders has been the star of the show a couple of times at Aspiring Women. My favorite subject that he ever talked about, and maybe some of you were here, was Lies About Guys. Anybody attend that show? And do you remember what he said? I mean, this was just perfect. He said, women are like spaghetti, cook spaghetti with everything touching everything so they can think about the fact that there maybe is no milk in the refrigerator and the socks are dirty and the kids need to get their homework done and there's a doctor's appointment tomorrow and a dentist appointment on Friday. 
Men, however, are waffles. <laughs> and they have those little individual boxes. And when they're in one of those boxes, they can't see over the sides. <laughs> So when you're talking to them, when they're driving the car and they don't hear a thing you say, it's because they're driving. <laughs> that made perfect sense to me, and my husband and I have had a better relationship ever since then. <laughs> so please, Dr. Flinders, come on up. We're going to do a little fun guessing game on Dr. Flinders, just to let you know about him. He is a family medicine doctor at the Aspires Review Clinic in Nakusa. He is also experienced in reading the Dex DEXA scan, which is what uh, the test that you have to see what your bone density is. And he'll talk about that a little later. He's a native of California and still is here in Wisconsin. <laughs> but he did attend Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine in Erie, Pennsylvania. So that might have been where he became acclimated to the cold. He completed his residency in Johnson City, New York. He and his lovely wife, who happened to live down the street from me, have four children. So let's just play a little game and see how much you know about Dr. Flinders. Does Dr. Flinders have any pets? <laughs> You're right, I only invite providers that have pets. <laughs> Good point. So Dr. Flinders does have a canine. How many do you think he has? Five, three, four, two. two. <laughs> and what breed do you think they might be? We have Labs, St. Bernard's, Doodles. Poodles! He does! He has two poodles! And so here's what happened. His lovely wife chose a poodle from a litter and then the breeder got very ill and so they decided they would adopt the mother too. The mother was a breeding dog and she wasn't used to really being out on a leash or in a house and they have worked really tirelessly and patiently with her. And every morning when I walk my big poodle past their driveway, the little one, the younger one, barks and the other one barks like this. <laughs> All true. Yeah. Uh, true or false, Dr. Flinders was a Girl Scout leader. True. Mixed, mixed response. He was a Boy Scout leader. For 10 years. I think you led some scouts into the Eagle Scout. Yes, okay. Let's see, can I think of anything else to nail you on? I will say that when we lost our power this summer, he called and offered to put, because he has a generator, offered to put anything in my freezer in his freezer, which was awfully nice. So he's a nice neighbor. I donated no meat to the family. All right, so without further ado, and a clicker for you. Here is Dr. Flinders. All right. So, uh, yeah, Nan did, did get that right. I grew up in uh, beautiful downtown Burbank, uh, which you may remember from Johnny Carson and uh, The Tonight Show. Uh, there was lots of filming that happened in Burbank. So uh, when I turned 16 and could date, it was really awesome because all the movie uh, places are all around there and they all send representatives up to have people view the shows before they come out and critique them. So uh, back then when schools were a little more open access, the theater people would uh, come up on, onto the campus and would look for people and would hand out movie tickets. And this was great for us, right? Because I could get a free movie ticket, I could ask them for another free movie ticket, and then I could take a date. And then my friends and my cousins would do the same thing. And we would go down to whatever studio it was that was showing it. Oftentimes it would be uh, Warner Brothers. And um, we would stand in line waiting to get in. And we learned that if you were just loud enough to call some attention to you, 
but not so loud that you were boisterous. That these people that just kind of walk by that, I don't know, were acting like they were important, but we didn't know what they really did for a while, uh, would hand you an envelope. And in the envelope it would say, will you stay after the show so that you can meet with the producer, or the editor, or something like that, and uh, give some feedback. Now we really loved it when we got the envelope. Because if we got an envelope, that meant we get to stay. It also meant we got free popcorn and drinks. <laughs> and at the end, when you actually met with all these high-tech people, um, to thank you for their time, you would get another envelope when you walked out, and it had 20 bucks in it. So we could go on a free day, get free popcorn, free soda, and sometimes even walk out with 20 bucks. So it was, it was great. Now, um, I grew up uh, as a, a kid in the 80s. And uh, so I, I grew up with different types of cars, and I love cars. And there was a particular car that I wanted. So I'm going to play a little tune, and you're going to tell me what car it was, and then I'll have a story to tell you about it, OK? So who can tell me what car did I want when you hear this? That is the General Lee, yes, 1969 Dodge Charger from the Dukes of Hazard. So I found a Dodge Charger that was not too far from my house, and I would pester my dad, Dad, when I turn 16, go ask if we can buy that car. And of course, he never went up and asked. And then I had a neighbor that lived down the street, and he worked at Warner Brothers. He happened to be the editor of multiple Clint Eastwood movies, and most recently was the editor for the Smallville series, if you know that TV series. And uh, so back when I was a kid, he would really egg me on, and he'd say, you know, if you get your dad to buy that car, I will take it down to the studio and have it painted exactly like the General Lee. Like, Dad! Dad! So that didn't ever happen. However, however, I got inspired by my neighbor across the street. So when I turned 16, I didn't have a Dodge Charger or General Lee. Uh, the next car, of course, I wanted when I turned 16 was Knight Rider. I wanted Kid. Uh, didn't get that one either. But uh, my neighbor had told me that if you wax your car all the time, it will be so aerodynamic that it will get better gas mileage. <laughs> so I would be out waxing my mom and dad's car to make sure that this happened. And lo and behold, one day, the neighbor that works at Warner Brothers said, you know, I can get you the wax that they put on the General Lee. <laughs> so, Bray, get me some. So he brought a bottle home. And I got this cool marketing idea. I decided I could go around to different businesses and offer to give a General Lee wax on their cars. And that's what I did for two years to make money. And, and in California, people are banged about their cars. So I would get paid anywhere from 60 to 100 bucks to wash and wax the car that I could claim was this is the same wax that they put on the General Lee and yes, I would run, jump, and slide across the hood and prove it to them. Now, what does that have to do with osteoporosis? Not, not all that much, but I was glad I didn't have osteoporosis and break a hip when I slid across the car. Um, but there you go. So that's, that is a little tidbit about me that uh, I did uh, many, many years. And... Um, I wish I could say I made enough money to pay for medical school, but it didn't. It didn't. Maybe it paid for some of the books or something like that. But um, so, all right. So I guess I got to get started with this here. All right. So that has some questions for you to consider that you can um, look at and uh, think about and know. All of these statements happen to be true. 
And so what is osteoporosis? Uh, osteoporosis is very common. It is caused by three things. There's three characteristic findings of osteoporosis. We have low bone mass, and we'll discuss that. We have a microarchitectural disruption, and we'll show you a picture of that. And we have skeletal fragility, and we'll talk about what that is. Because, of course, I have to throw in some big words for you, right? So at least it sounds like I really did go to medical school and I learned something uh, on there. Uh, they insisted that this be typed because if I were to handwrite it, you couldn't read any of the notes, right? So uh, it's all printed for you. Now, look at the second one. There's a, there's a capital N-O in there for a reason. Osteoporosis has no, zero, zip, nada, clinical manifestations. So when people come into my office and they say, oh, the winter's acting up and my osteoporosis is hurting me, I'm like, what did you break? Because osteoporosis doesn't hurt. Causes no pain at all. Now, once you crack something, that, that, that can hurt. And when you break something, that can, that can really hurt. So osteoporosis does not hurt. So if you want to get one big take-home message, remember that, file that back there. Osteoporosis does not hurt. Osteoarthritis, that might be a little different story. That, that one can hurt. Uh, and then this lists some of the common fractures that we see, vertebral fractures, that's gonna be in the spine of your back, followed by hip fractures. Um, right now is the time of year that uh, the orthopedists are doing really well with all this stuff, right? Because people walk out on the ice, they slip and fall, and uh, crack their hip, and find themselves over at the hospital, and sometimes finding themselves getting a hip replacement. So osteoporosis really means that we have some porous bone, okay? Think of it like Swiss cheese almost. There's, instead of your cheddar cheese that's solid block, we have Swiss cheese that has holes that are going through it. If you look at this under the microscope, you're going to see this, and I'll have a picture of that because I know all of you would love to know what does it really look like when you look in a microscope. So we have a picture of that. Uh, when you start to develop osteoporosis, then the holes get a lot bigger. So instead of having little tiny holes, you get a lot bigger holes. So I need someone to come up to, uh, to give an example. Come up. Come on down. Yeah, yes, yes. Isn't this great? All right. Are you going to be able to do this? Uh, she doesn't know. She's a little nervous. OK, what, what are these? What does that look like? Tongue depressors, and they're they're all clean and sterile because you know we used to be able to stick these into a bottle and pull them out, but now they're individually wrapped, which will be very helpful for us. So, okay, now only using your fingers can you hold those and break it, like completely snap every single one of them. Go. Yeah. Okay. She said it was too hard. There's only 12 tongue compressors here. <laughs> All right, here. Let's try that. No? Are you gonna teach exercises to strengthen the <laughs> All right, let's try this one. Did you hear that? Thank you. All right. She broke four of them. So, in a way, osteoporosis is kind of like that. So she applied a force, and we're going to presume that she applied the same force every single time. When there was a whole bunch of tongue depressors, it was very hard. Things didn't crack. We didn't hear a lot of noise with it as they became more osteopenic and we took a couple away there was still some strength there maybe she could exert a little bit more we might have heard a little something there but maybe we wouldn't have broken the entire stick once we got enough away then it was 
much easier. And of course, if I probably gave her one, she could have just snapped that easy, <laughs> right? So think of that, that when you meet your peak bone mass, you have a whole bunch, you have 12 of these sticks here. And through certain processes that, are, that we'll discuss, you start getting less and less and less, and so the same amount of force can now easily cause a crack that can happen. So why, what does that look like under the microscope, right? Because all of you are like, oh, you told me you were gonna show me the microscope. So this is what it kind of looks like. And if you look at the picture there, you can, you can probably tell that the bone that is on the left should be a little stronger than the bone that is on the right. And you can see a process there. Now realize, bone is living tissue. There's a whole bunch of cells and architecture that make up the bone. This is like a microscopic view of what little pieces of bone look like. So we could say that represents one of these. Well, when we have a whole bunch of them laced together, then it's like we have a whole bunch together. It's a little harder for it to crack. But when we have just little wimpy ones, I mean, on the right there, I, it's almost like they have a toothpick holding them up there. That could snap pretty easily. So why does this happen? There we go. Uh, our bodies go through a natural process, kind of like our skin does, that we break down our skin, we rebuild our skin. We do the same thing with bone. We break down bone, we rebuild bone. Now, we don't break down bone and then rebuild it, okay? It's, think of it more like it's being sanded down and then we, get, we add some other, and then we sand some more of it down and we add some other to it. Um, but as we age, some of that process just doesn't work as well and sometimes we actually sand down a little too much and we don't add a little bit more in for that. So there's some cells that are responsible for this, and there's some names of, of what these uh, stages are. So bone resorption is where it breaks down and is removed. So think of that as the sanding down and getting rid of the, the dust. And there's actually a bug here. Um, and bone formation, which is gonna be the laying down part. And so here's a, here's a cute thing so you can look at it and kind of think of it a little bit more visually. Okay, so the osteoclasts are the cells that are responsible to break down and remove the bone. And the osteoblasts, I remember that because osteoblasts build. And so they help form the bone. So what are some of the risk factors that uh, we can look at? <clears throat> so there's some of them that, by golly, we just have zero control over. And so you could figure some of those out pretty easily. Um, no, actually, we're gonna talk about the ones we do have control over. I guess we'll hit the other ones afterwards. <laughs> but ones that we can, now well, some people may say, number one, I don't have any control over. Uh, but certainly, we, we, we do have some control over that. Uh, what, what it is that we put in our mouth, uh, certainly, if, um, uh, if we're unable to purchase certain types of foods, okay, then there may be something uh, uh, that, is, that is there with that. But for the most part, we can control what we stick in our mouth, eat, and swallow. Physical activity, <clears throat> that's another one, and we'll hear from um, Elizabeth about the importance of physical activity and how that helps keep our bones strong. Um, so. Of course, you would expect that I need to say something about exercise is good and physical activity is good and you, you need to go do that. And this is another good reason why because think of physical activity as, as strengthening and thickening these sticks so that we don't get them broke as easily. Body weight, and the highlight of this one is more so being significantly underweight as opposed to I'm significantly overweight, okay? now. That does not mean that I'm saying, go out and become morbidly obese so that you will not have osteoporosis, okay? That, that is not what I was saying there. Number four, I, you would fault me. You would, you would feel so bad if you said, a doctor got up and said nothing about smoking, right? I, we have to fit that in. That somehow fits in just about everything. Uh, this one, it actually really does, not just because we want to tell you that you shouldn't, you shouldn't smoke, but uh, 
Smoking has adverse effects on bone health, as does alcohol. And uh, we'll discuss a little later about how much alcohol affects our bone health, because it may surprise you, some of you, on that. Now there's also risk factors that we can't control. Uh, and if, you have dis if you've determined how you can control number one, please come talk to me after, because I'd like to market that with you and uh, I'll give you the name of the company that makes the wax for the General Lee uh, in return for that. Um, so we do not know how to manipulate our age yet, um, but certainly as we age, particularly a female, because of changes that naturally happen, that sometimes you're excited happens, and other times maybe you're not as excited that that happens. Uh, but age plays a fact in that. Gender does. Um, me being a male, I'm less likely to come down with osteoporosis than everybody else in this room, because I don't see the toy for top guy is here still. <laughs> so it, as I look out, compared to me, everybody looks higher risk to me uh, for osteoporosis. Ethnicity does, and this is a kind of interesting one. Uh, it's got on there the white and Asian. Some of that is felt to be related to body habitus and, and size and frame size, and also dietary intake. Uh, so other cultures that tend to do a lot more physically demanding work, that have bigger, wider frames, that uh, eat different types of foods that tend to be more calcium and vitamin D rich, they're gonna have a little bit less of a risk of becoming osteoporotic, even if they are a female. Uh, having a family history, of course, you can't change where your mom and dad, uh, who your mom and dad were and where they came from. And then other health problems. Now, you see vitamin D deficiency on there, and okay, I can give you that, well, I can do something about that if I know I'm vitamin D deficient. I can take a supplement. I can try to spend uh, some time out in uh, uh, sunlight. Um, the other ones maybe are a little, little harder to say I can easily change and overcome that, but people that have thyroid disease are particularly hyperparathyroidism uh, because they will tend to seep calcium out of the bone and they will have high calcium levels. Uh, so that's something that we normally want to jump on to say that may be a risk factor that once we get you treatment, then we can help change that. So how do we screen for osteoporosis? Um, all women age 65 and older should at some time have a screening, and that's DXA, so you say a DEXA, um, it stands for Dual Energy X-ray Absorptiometry. It's easier to say DEXA. So I'll just say DEXA. Uh, I was lucky to get that out the first time, uh, so I'm just gonna say DEXA. So DEXA is the main tool that we have that can help us identify who has lower bone mass, who has osteopenia, or who has osteoporosis. And you can make a diagnosis of osteoporosis by hitting by any one of those bullet points. So if they have a DEXA scan that shows a T-score of less than, um, less than or equal to negative 2.5, actually it should say negative 2.5 on there. There's, so there's, that's, that's not correct. So it should say less than or equal to negative 2.5. Um, a a T-score is used to compare, essentially, what is your bone strength and composition compared to someone that would be younger and at their, at their peak age. Uh, it's not listed on here because it doesn't diagnose osteoporosis, but a Z-score, which will be on the report, that compares on how you are to other people that are within your age group. We don't use those to diagnose osteoporosis, we use a T-score. The next two talk about a FRAX score. Now, a FRAX score is something that um, the DEXA machine will actually calculate for us, and it gives us a percentage. If we get any 
FRAC score that shows that their major osteoporotic hip fracture risk is 20% or greater, or their risk for hip fracture is 3% or greater, then we can diagnose osteoporosis, even if the bone density says where they land and where their T-score is doesn't look like it's in the osteoporotic range. Why do we do that? Because we know through data that having a FRAC score that is that high significantly increases the risk of a fracture. And if we can get a fracture, then we know that we've got some osteoporosis that is there. Now, 3% doesn't sound like a lot, right? I mean, maybe 20% doesn't sound like a whole bunch. And sometimes, some things that we do in medicine are based on very small percentages that actually mean long-standing larger problems. And the last one is if somebody has a fragility fracture. So people that get a fragility fracture are the ones that we can diagnose without having them get a bone density test or a FRAC score. So this slide tells you what a fragility fracture is. So it's a fracture that occurs from a fall from standing height or less, so if you were kneeling, um, without trauma. So that's, that's the good key word there. Uh, I had a patient that came in that uh, fell onto grass from a standing height and received some fractures. And I was like, wow, that's, uh, you were just standing there. We later found out, she didn't tell us the whole story, uh, she had two huge dogs that barreled her over and were leaping. And so that added some trauma. So now I can say, ah, okay. Now that maybe makes a little more sense as to why just a fall from a standing height onto grass would make you break. Um, but the areas involved, it can't be the skull, the cervical spine, hand speed, ankles, and is not a stress fracture. Um, so as long as it doesn't meet any of that, then if you have a fragility fracture, then we diagnose you with osteoporosis. So if I were to fall down right now, and I broke um, uh, my spine, uh, my vertebra, or my hip, then they would say, boy, this guy who thought he was low risk uh, had a fragility fracture, and so I would be diagnosed with osteoporosis. So this shows what a DEXA machine uh, looks like. Uh, essentially, it is a fancy x-ray machine that uses very, very low amounts of radiation to give us an x-ray and to calculate these scores so that we can determine what is the FRAC score, what is the T-score, what do the pictures look like, and can we come up with an idea where is our bone density, how strong are these bones, and do we come up with you have normal, you have osteopenia, which would be like I'm in between, I'm not osteoporotic, but I'm not as strong, or do we have osteoporosis? Uh, a report can come looking like that, and uh, it doesn't show it on this picture, maybe it's the next one. Well, the, the color graph area up there, they kind of make it pretty easy. Basically, uh, if things fall in the green area, it's good, right? If it's in the green to yellow, the light green to yellow area, probably osteopenic. We start hitting the orange area and the red area, osteoporosis. So this will show uh, uh, osteoporosis is, is uh, on a DEXA. The diagnosis has to come from spine, hip, or forearm. So let me take a little side note on something that isn't on here and comment about I forget what they're called, there's those screenings where they'll come by like to a church or some big organization and you pay, Lifeline, okay. And uh, so the screening that they do for osteoporosis is non-diagnostic, okay? Because they do an ultrasound of your heel. So, in order to diagnose osteoporosis, right, we said you have to have a fragility fracture. 
you have to have a FRAC score that is concerning, or you have to have a DEXA scan that shows a T-score less than or equal to negative 2.5. An ultrasound is none of those. <coughs> so anytime somebody comes in with one of those, we say all of these are valid except for the osteoporosis screen or the bone density screen uh, that they do. Uh, at least in the United States, those are the guidelines. Now in some other countries, they may consider the use of ultrasound of a heel uh, to have some diagnostic value, but in the United States, it is not considered diagnostic for that. Now that doesn't mean Lifeline is not good and is not worth some of your money, because I can tell you if I had to order all those tests and, and just give you that order, you can probably get it cheaper through Lifeline for some of those, so. Uh, just a little tidbit on that. Okay, and here you can see some of the, the graphs uh, that come in and it will show, I can't read it on here. Okay, yeah, so it's showing this is the normal range, here's the osteopenic range, here's the osteoporotic range. This will give some examples of essentially what is your bone mineral density, how thick is it, how you can think of that. This will give a T-score, which is a standard deviation, how far do you deviate away from what would be considered a potential peak bone mass. Z-score would say how far away do you uh, deviate compared to those that are within your age group. Um, and then uh, it will give uh, a statement, at least this one does, on uh, osteopenia, osteoporosis, or normal. So what we do is we look at these pictures, uh, we see if it kind of jives with what we see here. We look at the numbers, uh, and then uh, it's not shown on this, but uh, the one that we have at uh, Aspirus uh, Riverview Hospital and a, at uh, Aspirus Doctors Clinic, uh, we'll then also calculate the FRAC score. It's a separate sheet of paper, it literally says FRAC, has a big box and says major osteoporotic <laughs> fracture. Here's the percent. Uh, risk for hip fracture, here's the percent, and we can use that information. Uh, all that gets put together on a little report, gets sent back to the ordering provider, and they get a clear little uh, snippet that says, here's their bone density, here is the diagnosis, here are some recommendations on when you might want to repeat it, and here are... Um, okay. Uh, and here are um, uh, other considerations that you could do to, to think of, should, is this someone that should be put on medication or have some uh, additional testing? What are some ways we can prevent or uh, delay osteoporosis? This slide is great because the right, best thing to do is uh, prevent the loss from the first place and then try to make up for all the loss <laughs> that happened. <coughs> Okay, so some of the things, you can get adequate nutrition, uh, you can have your physical activity, here's our exercise, maintaining a normal body weight, and uh, avoiding smoking or alcohol. Now, you've been waiting, I know you've been dying here, saying, oh, he mentioned something about alcohol, I gotta see where this falls, so have your eyes drift down to the third bullet point, and it says, don't have excess, excess alcohol, more than two drinks in a 24-hour period. Some studies would say, actually, that is the recommendation for a male. For a female, it would be one. So, there's a little chatter going on right here. here. Yeah. And so you notice they did you good that they gave you lemon water for this because they wanted to make sure that you weren't doing anything to destroy your bones while you were listening to me. Um, now steroids come up. So sometimes we have uh, people that have conditions that are treated with steroids. And steroids are good and they're bad. Uh, when you're on them for a long time, they can be more bad, but uh, sometimes you have to be that on them a long time just so that you can actually function and have a reasonable quality of life. The main threshold value that seems to be most related to bone health is whether or not you are taking 7.5 milligrams or more on a continual basis. So if you come in and let's say you have asthma and you went to see your provider, the urgent care, the ER, and they gave you a 
prednisone taper or they gave you uh, 50 milligrams of prednisone to take for five or seven days, that's not really what we're talking about here. Uh, this would be, I'm taking 20 milligrams a day, every day, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, that's someone that's gonna be much higher risk. So if we have someone that is chronically on steroids, we're gonna to try to see, can we get them down to at least 7.5, or better yet, can we get them down to five or below for that? Bone health-wise though, 7.5 seems to be uh, the, main, uh, the main one here. But now Nan would be disappointed if we didn't have a picture of a dog uh, in here, right? And the dog's way to help prevent osteoporosis and bone loss is just bury your bones deeper. <laughs> and if you can figure out how to do that on your own, also come talk to me and let me know about that. Okay, and uh, I'm running out of time here, but the last uh, thing we can, we can uh, uh, just kind of touch on is treatment options. You'll notice the first bullet point there is not phenomenal. Okay, if you come in with strep throat, I feel really good that as long as you're not allergic to penicillin and you take it, you won't have strep throat anymore. You'll be cured from that. Uh, you come in with osteoporosis, I can't tell you that I can cure you. We have some things that can help but I can't cure you from that. This is not a curable disease. It's a disease that we try to manage. And then you also know, because you already filed into your brain earlier today, and all of you have spaghetti-like brains, as opposed to my waffle-like brain, that, you know, <laughs> that um, it is better to prevent the loss than try to make it up. And osteoporosis doesn't hurt. There's no pain with that. Now, we can give some medications, and medications come in a variety of types. Uh, essentially, I'll boil it down to this. Overwhelmingly, for the most part, what medication does is either decrease osteoclastic activity, which is the sanding down, the breaking down, and or increasing, in one way or another, osteoblastic activity, so that we're gonna lay down some more. There's different mechanisms of how that can be accomplished, and different drugs have a different mechanism for it. Uh, the listing up here has predominantly brand name drugs. I would say probably the oral bisphosphonate that is most popular would be Fosamax, uh, that is alendronate. Um, the hormonal ones are occasionally used. I, I would say they're not as popular. Uh, there are some injectable ones. Uh, let's see, Reclass is listed as a bisphosphonate. That's the one that you go get an IV infusion once a year. Um, some people like that, uh, particularly if they don't have a drug plan because that's covered through Medicare Part AB and not D. Uh, so that's kind of nice. And the other one is the rank ligand inhibitor, which is called Prolia. That's a little injection, kind of like insulin, but it is not insulin that you get uh, in your provider's office uh, once every six months. Prolia, though, is one that we don't take a holiday from. Uh, Prolia, once you're on it, you're on it for life. Uh, the bisphosphonate class, once you're on it, we do tend to have times that we will look at taking a drug holiday and take time off of the medication. So I get to turn the rest of the time over to Elizabeth, who is all smiles and ready to come up and tell you the physical therapy side and some things you can do to help make sure that you maintain good and adequate bone health. So I think we turn the time back over to Nan Taylor, our host. And here she comes. Come on now. So unfortunately, Dr. Flinders has another obligation this evening. He's going to do something. He's going to build something with tongue depressors, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Did you want to take these with you? He's given them to us. It might be a door prize tonight. <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry that he won't be here to answer your, especially the broken ones. That's right. Uh, I'm sorry that he won't be here to answer your questions, but if you want to 
um, write them down on your surveys, we will get them back to you. We'll put something out on the, either on the landing page or do or send something out in constant contact or something like that. So next up is Elizabeth Ironside, who is a native of Wisconsin Rapids, I am proud to say. She's a physical therapist with, with Aspirus Riverview Therapies. She earned her doctorate in physical therapy from the University of Minnesota. Those gophers almost beat those badgers, don't they? I was watching and cheering for gophers because my kid's a, a University of Minnesota graduate. She worked in St. Paul in an inpatient brain injury rehab and outpatient neurology and concussion rehabilitation center. And while living in the Twin Cities, she got married. She has three children. And in 2014, she and her family moved back to her hometown, which is Wisconsin Rapids. And after enjoying a year off, she joined us at Aspirus Riverview. She's an American Board of Physical Therapy Neurological Clinical Specialist. She loves seeing a variety of patients, but specializes in balance, vestibular disorders, Parkinson's stroke, and post-concussion rehabilitation. Outside of work, Elizabeth stays busy with family and friends, loves playing outdoors year-round. Her family is very active, uh, the entire Ironside family is, which is neat, and is looking forward to snowshoeing and downhill skiing soon. Her children are now 10, 7, and 5. The 7-year-old asked for an iPhone 11. <laughs> Elizabeth said Santa does not bring those things, and neither do your parents. And she and her husband love traveling and hiking with the children. Earlier this year, they traveled to upstate New York and took in the sights of the Big Apple, and I hear a Broadway show, too. So another fun fact about Elizabeth is she is a graduate of the Carlson School of Business at the University of Minnesota. I believe your degree was in marketing. And once she graduated, she told her parents, I think my passion is elsewhere, and we're glad she figured that out. So let me introduce to you Elizabeth. We'll see if that works. That way I don't have to hold it the whole time. Oops. I'm just gonna... <laughs> Looks like we missed some <laughs> a slide or two there. But... So I'm gonna talk, oh, there's the pictures of my family that I sent along, so if you, we were hiking in New York, uh, then we were hiking in the Eau Claire Dells, we went to Wicked, and that was um, uh, my foray into downhill skiing, which I took up last year because my family wants to do it. So I decided I would try, and so far my knees are still intact, and no fractures, even with the falls that I took, so. So I'm going to talk mostly about balance this evening. Uh, so some of you have probably heard me speak on it before, but uh, balance is really important, especially when we are trying to prevent fractures, because the best way to prevent a fracture is to stay on your feet, right? Keep yourself from falling. Uh, so balance is the ability to stay upright when you're standing, walking, sitting, or reaching. Uh, So why do we need good balance, which I already touched on, but to reduce the risk of falls and injuries. You know, falling can cause fractures, it can also um, cause head injuries, it can cause damage to um, your joints, your muscles, you twist an ankle, um, multitude of problems. But 95% of hip fractures are the result of a fall, uh, usually sideways falls. So reducing injuries, and that's what we're going to mostly talk about tonight, but it's also important to prevent falls so that you can continue to do the things that you love. Um, people I see fall when they are golfing, gardening, hunting. You want to keep playing with those grandkids. And if your balance isn't good, then you maybe can still do the things around your house, but you aren't able to you know, go to the water park with the grandkids. So it's important to work both on your balance to stay in your home, but also to do those fun things that we all want to keep doing as long as we possibly can. So there's four systems that really work together um, that contribute to your balance. There's your vision, simple one, it's what you see. 
what you see in front of you keeps you oriented to where you, where you are. And there's awareness of your body's position, which is sensation. And that's the, the way I think of it is that if you're standing in sand, you know you're standing on sand. Um, proprioception is the other part of that awareness of body position, and that's uh, knowing if you are walking on a hill. So you know that your, your joint is bent in a different way than if you were walking on a flat surface. There's your inner ear, which is your vestibular system. That also gives you information about if you are moving and where you are in space, if you're bent over. It's the inner ear that works to tell you those things. Um, and then your musculoskeletal system responds to your inner ear, where you are, where your body is, and what you are seeing to keep you upright. And then the brain kind of takes all that information, works together to keep us up. So if you are having problems with any of these systems, um, it will cause balance problems. So for example, many people out there have cataracts. So having those taken care of can help with your balance. There's also macular degeneration or just the need for glasses, making sure that you have appropriate glasses. Bifocals in general can cause balance difficulties because it changes what you, what you see and when, there's, when a step is there in front of you, um, those, that change in the glasses can sometimes trip people up. Um, awareness of body position, again, as we get older, our sensation isn't as good. There is a variety of different things that cause decreased sensation to our feet. Um, I think of diabetes as being the number one reason for that, but when you don't feel what's underneath you, it's harder to um, judge and change how you're moving to address, address what you're feeling when you're not feeling it. The vestibular system, um, there's a variety of different things that can go wrong there, and I could talk about that for a whole night. I think I did one time. Um, <laughs> but the, the vestibular system, a lot of people think of that as when I'm dizzy, or I get dizzy with certain things, and that certainly causes falls. I see a lot of people who fall simply because they're dizzy, or they're dizzy with certain movements. Uh, and then the musculoskeletal system, joint pain, if your knees are stiff, um, or if your muscles are weak, you're not able to react to a, a small trip or a, a slip in the same way that somebody who's real strong or doesn't have pain can. <coughs> so then I wanna go into some risk factors for falling. So the biggest risk factors, these are the top six, is if you've had a previous fall, then you are at risk of having another fall. Uh, <coughs> balance impairments, decreased muscle strength, so when you are, as we get older, we just tend to be weaker if we aren't moving, if we're not exercising. Um, so that one will increase our fall risk. Vision impairment, which we already talked about a little bit. Taking more than four medications and certain specific types of medications will cause, you know, side effects or sometimes dizziness or having a, a number of different medications will affect our balance and cause dizziness, increase your risk of falling. Some other risk factors that are out there that also increase falling are depression, dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, which that's the, the people who say they get dizzy or lightheaded when you first sit up or when you first go to stand up. You take those first few steps and you get lightheaded. Um, and that again, it happens more often as we get older and the simplest advice I have for that is just not to rush um, anywhere. So when you first get up in the morning, sit at the edge of the bed before you jump up. Well, that's a problem there when we have urinary urgency, right? Which also <laughs> happens because the first thing everybody does when they wake up in the morning is they're like, I gotta go to the bathroom. You jump up and you start running for the bathroom. And that's when people fall. Uh, so being able to balance those things and think, and think about you know, I need to sit here for a minute before I head right for the bathroom. Just being over the age of 80 increases your risk. Being a female, um, the arthritis and pain which we talked about, the diabetes, and again, diabetes affects your vision, it affects your sensation, so you are going to change those pieces of balance and then will uh, increase your risk of falling. But the good thing is, is a lot of these risk factors are modifiable, kind of like Dr. Flinders talked about. 
before. So these are slightly different ones. These are balance risk factors. So what can you do to prevent falls and make that balance better? Well, the, the balance and the weakness, there is you know, exercises, moving, all sorts of different things out there to help with those. Your vision, see your eye doctor um, or your optometrist, make sure that your prescriptions are up to date. Uh, talk with your pharmacist and your physician about the medications you're on. You know, let them know if you're getting that lightheadedness or dizziness with um, moving around or if you, if you think that maybe one of your medications is causing you balance problems, talk to them because they, you know, they, they know those things and they understand those medications and there may be alternatives. Uh, depression, it's treatable. The dizziness, physical therapists, um, orthostatic hypotension, mentioned that one. Um, the arthritis and the pain, again, see what you can do about those different things, either through your physician, through physical therapy, and make sure that your diabetes is managed, because well-managed diabetes is going to cause far less complications than if it's not controlled. Um, home setting. So in our homes, um, we can decrease our risk of falling by making sure that we have clear walkways, you know, get rid of that clutter. Uh, making sure that you don't have throw rugs, or if you do, they're secured. And I see a lot of people and they're like, throw rugs are non-negotiable, I love them. Or I'll see men and they're like, my wives will never let me get rid of the throw rugs. Get rid of the throw rug. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really nice, it collects the dirt, you kind of like it under your feet, but it is, some of them slip and they are usually tripping hazards for people. Uh, make sure your wires and cords are out of the way so you can't trip on them. Uh, anything that's broken, get a handyman. Make sure you have a handyman. You want a secure railing um, in, your, in your bathroom, in your shower, on the stairwells. You know, if you have a door threshold where you have a railing, make sure you have those secured and well, well fastened. Uh, for people with low vision, there's some other ideas with marking the edges of stairs to make sure you don't miss them. You know, sometimes people will miss that bottom step or that top step and that'll cause a trip or a fall. Uh, having good lighting that you can reach easily. And grab bars in the bathroom. You can see the picture of the setup. And there are different companies out there that uh, specialize in bathroom setups or accessibility in the home. So if, if these are becoming problems for you or a loved one, you're know, looking into that and seeking out those resources so that people can stay in their homes longer. A couple other modifiable risk factors, good shoes. Uh, I see people who, you know, their shoes are 15 years old, the soles are coming off, they're tripping because of it, you know, Buying a good pair of shoes is important. Um, if you need to use a walker or a cane, if somebody's told you you should, then do it. You know, I hear people, well, yeah, I've got that. It's, it's in my car, right? You know, well, I left it in my car. Like, so you walked across the icy parking lot? Well, I didn't want to get it out of the trunk. So if it's going to keep you on your feet, then it's good to use it. And those are just some other options. If you if you have a loved one that is a faller, making sure that they have um, some a setup where they can get to a phone where they could use like a life alert or an alarm device if they were to have a fall so that hopefully it would reduce their risk of injury and somebody could help them get back up. So put in the plug for physical therapists. We are experts in movement. Um, we will help people maintain their health and fitness um, through strength training, and we're gonna talk a little bit about a TheraBand exercise program, um, balance training, and we're gonna do some balance exercises here also. And so going forward, a general balance and exercise program is likely enough prevention if your balance is okay. If you find you are somebody who is falling or if you know somebody who's falling, you know, these exercises I'm gonna talk about may not be right for them. It would be best for them to probably see a physician, talk to the doctor about it, potentially get that referral for physical therapy. Um, the exercises may be the right ones, but it would be best that they were evaluated before they started into a specific exercise program. Uh, so 
there's lots of ways out there to improve your balance. You don't have to go home and do these exercises I give you. You know, the, the most important thing about balance or exercise in general is to find something you love. Because if you love it, or at least sort of like it, you're more likely to stick with it. Yeah. <laughs> most people don't love it. A lot of the times you love it when you're done. It makes you feel better. But if you can find something that you enjoy and you can stick with, that's more important than, well, it'd be best if I went for a 10 mile run. No, how about if I go for a 15 minute walk? Yes, do that, that, that counts, that's, that's good. You know, you gotta start somewhere. But these are things that we know that improve your balance. Tai Chi, dancing, uh, even sleep. So there you go. Get, get your eight hours of sleep, that's important too. Uh, so there's one other slide that I think I didn't get in here, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, bone health and exercise. And Dr. Flinders talked on the importance of exercise for bone health, and there are some specific things that we're going to go through a few of them, but bone health, weight-bearing exercise is really important for bone health. So if you want to maintain your bone or build your bone as as best as we can, doing things in weight bearing. So swimming and biking are great exercises, but a brisk walk, hiking, yard work, um, any of those things are strength training. Those are the best things you can do for your bones because it, it kind of requires that impact on your bone. The way he talked about the shearing that builds things up, it needs that, you know, swimming is great for cardio cardiovascular fitness or biking also, but it's not going to help with that bone and muscle strength in the same way that weight training or a brisk walk will help. Uh, posture is also really important for your bone health. Um, standing up tall, because he talked about vertebral fractures, so fractures in your spine. And when you're bent over like this, it's more likely you will end up with those fractures in your spine than if you get yourself up tall. So everybody take a deep breath. Did everybody just get at least a half inch taller? Because <laughs> you all just sat up just a little bit, you know, and that's, so that's important. That's a good way to just improve your posture right from the start without having to do any sort of exercise. Uh, and if you do have osteoporosis, one thing to avoid with exercise is a lot of twisting because that can be really hard on the bones. So if you already know you have osteoporosis, nothing we're going to do here involves a lot of twisting, but you want to be cautious with those things. So then we're gonna go, and in your folder there are exercises. So why don't you pull those out? Because these pictures, I modified them just a little bit. So we're gonna start with the, we'll start with the second one, the single leg balance. So these are some things you can try. How am I doing on time? I'll, go, I'll move through quickly. You're good. Okay. You're good. Did everybody find their exercises? Yep. So if anybody would like to stand up and join in, you are welcome to try. So you want to hold on to something steady. And then you want to try to pick up one of your legs. And just working on that balance on one leg, you can pick up your hand, I'll let everybody kind of get, get themselves up. Yep, so you can just stand on one leg. And I recommend that people do that for 30 seconds and then switch to your other leg. If it's too hard, you can always put your hand down and work on just picking it up for a few seconds. If it's too easy, at home you could try standing on a pillow or a cushion something that you won't bottom out on because that'll change that surface. Uh, I tell people sometimes in the clinic a boat cushion is a good thing because many people have a boat and they have a boat cushion somewhere. Uh, so trying that if you want to make that harder. The next one I'm going to give you is a little easier than one legged standing, but standing heel to toe. So put one foot directly in front of the other. And then you'll feel this one ends up working at your hips and your ankles. Usually people can feel those little muscles in their ankles moving and those are our balance some of our the most important muscles for our balance 
Yep, and you put a hand down if you need to and work on picking it up as you can. And if that one's real easy for you, you could practice walking heel to toe. So then that would make it a little harder. I tell people to do that in a hallway where you've got a wall close. Because then you can put a hand down if you need to. Again, it's more important we say stay safe because we don't want to fall. All right, I'm going to jump forward. We're going to skip that seated one. But for anybody who's still sitting, they can do the next exercise right there, going up back and forth with their toes, just in sitting, rocking up and down with your toes, because that helps strengthen your ankles. And the, the fourth one there, the standing toe raise, is going up on your toes from standing. In this one, you can hold on to something. You know, this one we're looking at strengthening here. So you want to raise up, hold it for a second or two, and come back down. Raise up, hold it for a second or two, or, and come back down. So we're working those calf muscles here. And if that one's too easy, you're welcome to do it on one leg. So you could do 10 of them on one leg and 10 of them on the other. And, you, if you, and that's, pretty, that's pretty tough. You're going to feel that in those muscles once you get to that 8 or 10 number. Okay, now I'm going to let everybody sit back down, and I'm going to go through the other four exercises here. <laughs> so the band does have latex in it, just in case anyone's allergic to latex, I just wanted to let you know the band has latex. <laughs> But the next exercise there is the, the hip abduction. So that's bringing one leg out to the side. So you can tie that band. You can tie that together and put it around your ankles. And then you can hold on to counter, kitchen counter, kitchen table, and bring your leg out to the side. And that strengthens those hip muscles or your glute med. Those muscles tend to be weak in everybody because we do things forward. We strengthen these muscles. We don't do things sideways. So it's a good one to do to strengthen those mu muscles. You can do it with or without the band. And if you want to do it in sitting, you can just tie it around your thighs and open up that way by bringing your legs out to the side. Yeah, and then you can hold it. I think the bands got cut a little short, but. So that's another way to do that. So the last two exercises focus on that mid-back. I talked about the importance of posture with osteoporosis and preventing fractures. Um, the last two exercises both help with your posture. So the, the one has the band tied into a door. So what you do is you put it in the door frame and you close the door and stand on the other side of it and then you pull back. Squeezing for both of them, you're gonna pinch your shoulder blades together. Working on that nice upright posture. And the, the last one on there, you're just going to hold the band and you're going to pull it out to the side. Again, pinching your shoulder blades together. Good. So with the exercises, I wrote some numbers on there. You know, those are just a guideline, things you can try. Um, but it gives you a few things to try at home. It's, they put it on this nice card stock for you so you can keep it somewhere and have it handy for these uh, winter days when you don't want to go out in the snow and the ice. You have a few exercises to try there. So these are just the same exercises. There's also community programs out there to help with balance. Um, these are some things that are in our community, uh, also for strength and exercise. And then just 
In summary, we want to address the risk factors that we can to improve our balance and our bone health, uh, which is participating in an exercise program and certainly seeing a physical therapist if you um, do believe that you have some problems with your balance or your strength.